Well, good morning. So you can be, well, thankful or not thankful, depending on uh, how you view this at the end of it. But uh, if you're here, you're going to be the ones hearing it. If uh, you're not here, they can't hear a thing that's coming out uh, right now. For some reason, the sound's not going out. So uh, I'm just going to give it to you all, and you'll just have to go, you missed the most fantastic serve. And just <laughs> let them know, like, yes, you can go on vacation, but that's the cost of, of going on vacation. We're glad you're here this morning. Uh, in front of you is a QR code. If you're our guest this morning, uh, you could either have tapped the NFC as you came in, or there's a QR code in front of you. You can do that scan on your camera. It'll just take you to a quick little uh, mobile landing page uh, that has a sermon outline, uh, kind of where we're going, a uh, passage, but it also has a connection card. And if you're our guest, if you would fill that out, you know, what it will do is just uh, let us, one, know that you're here, and then we'll send you an email. Uh, we're not going to spam you, just uh, an email that shows nonprofits that we support uh, here locally around the nation, around the globe. And then if you would respond back with which one you like out of those six, then we'll make a donation on your behalf. So during our time of giving, that's for our members and our regular attenders, and instead we'd like to give on your behalf. And so if you would just give us that information, uh, we would love to get to know you, uh, send that out to you, and then uh, show the generosity of God. We'll get your Bibles over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Have you ever had a moment... When you're talking to a friend, a coworker, a family member, and you felt the urge to share the gospel. The conversation was going in such a direction where this is a great time for the gospel to answer whatever is causing them a problem, and you didn't take the opportunity. Maybe you were afraid of saying the wrong thing. Maybe you were scared that you would sound like a radical, you'd be one of those Jesus freaks. But whatever it is, you didn't take that opportunity that was before you. Paul here is calling us to a boldness that is found in the hope that we have in Jesus and not to become discouraged over perceived failures or shortcomings. And in fact, he is going to lift the burden of evangelism or what he's going to be calling gospel ministry by showing us that God is even sovereign in salvation. And so we should have this hope before us. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, first six verses. He writes, Therefore, since we have this ministry... And so it's the ministry he talked about in chapter 3, you've seen the last couple of weeks. Because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. It's an incredible passage as Paul begins to kind of make this transition to gospel ministry. And so there's a couple of things I want us to learn as we have this gospel ministry ourselves. And so the first thing I think right out of the gate, if you're taking notes, is he says, do not lose heart. That's the, the words that he's using in the Greek. Do not despair. Do not give up. Uh, all through this letter, he has been repeating this theme. We do not despair get discouraged. We do not feel like quitting. We are confident. We are encouraged by what's going on. And again and again, you're going to find this note as a dominant theme throughout this letter. And so I talk to a lot of Christians and they get discouraged, especially today. But when you talk to them, basically what you discover is they do not see themselves as Paul saw himself. They don't see themselves as actually being an instrument of God at work. Instead, what happens is they're focusing on what they're doing for God, or at least in the moment, what they're not doing for God. And the focus kind of becomes on me. They don't seem to understand that the basis for this ministry that Paul speaks about, which we now call the new covenant, this new arrangement for living, which God has provided in Christ. And so Paul tells us, don't lose heart in the midst of a, a church 
that he planted. He's saying don't lose heart when this is the very church who's now beginning to reject him. They're rejecting his apostleship. They're re- uh, he's enduring these hardships in life and ministry and it's not producing the many converts that the super apostles are producing. So think about his life in the midst of this. He's saying, don't lose heart. Like, Paul, you have every reason to lose heart. And he says, don't lose heart. Why does he not lose heart despite all of this rejection? He tells us from the get-go, I have been given this ministry just as you have been given this ministry by the mercy of God. That alone should be... Don't lose heart. It's not your ministry. It's God's ministry. It's not by your intelligence. It's not by your personality. It is not by your training. It is not by your study. It is not by your prestige or your success or your networking capabilities. You have been given this ministry because you have been saved by grace alone through the mercy of God alone. That's it. We are the recipients of of God's grace, which pardons us from our sins. We are the recipients of his mercy, which consoles us. His grace is his love towards the guilty. His mercy is an expression of that love to the distressed. And it's when we become aware of that more and more each day, that the mercy of God in our distress, in our, uh, in our hardships, it, when we're drawn to the grace of God, then it It deals with us in our guilt, and it deals with us also in our pride. And we should remind ourselves this morning that there is more mercy in the Lord Jesus than there is sin in us. And because this ministry is from God, we don't lose heart. It's not yours. You didn't invent it. And Paul tells us this because there is a real temptation to lose heart. There is so much in life and ministry that can cause us to want to give up to lose heart, to be afraid, to shrink back. There are expectations we can't fulfill. There are accusations that we can't avoid. There are indifferences that we can't overcome, but we don't lose heart. He says, despite expectations that can't be fulfilled, despite accusations that can't be avoided, indifferences that can't be overcome, in fact, blindness that we cannot relieve. Do not lose heart. Why? Because it is not us, but it is Christ in us in the ministry of God that is work in achieving things in which we are unaware. Now some of you may go, well, that's all good, but I'm not gifted like you. I can't come up with those answers off the top of my head. That's a lie you're falling for. You are as gifted as I am. The difference between you and me is I've simply spent more time in the passage. I am not smarter, I am not a better speaker, I am not quicker on my feet. If those were the things that made the difference, then I would be drawing people to Jason and not Jesus. We have the same spirit that works equally in us both. And Paul says, do not lose heart. Walk in boldness that it is provided by the mercy of God. Then he's going to give us another not to. He says, do not deceive or distort. Those words deceive and distort, they're pointing us back to chapter 2. And if you remember, Paul says, we do not peddle the word of God. Uh, that, that word peddle was a reference to someone who would buy something for a price. They would fiddle with it, and then they would settle, sell it for a higher price. In particular, it was a reference to small dealers in wine. And they had become notorious for diluting their wine with water or compounding it with some extra drugs, maybe. And so that the substance would make it more appealing or make it more profitable. That's the notion that he's talking about, deceit and deception, do not peddle. And so that's why Paul says, we've renounced these shameful and secret ways. We don't use deception, we do not use distortion. Now, I think when we hear those words, we think of the obvious deception and distortions that we see in modern Western Christianity. Bribery, lies, promises that God never gives in Scripture. I mean, you hear of churches giving away iPads for attendance, for direct manipulation of Scripture. Either I put something in there that God just simply does not say, or I take something out because I don't like the way that it's worded. Many will give false promises that are never promised by God. We call it health, wealth, prosperity, gospel. But I don't think that's exactly what Paul has in mind here. He is obviously against those things. But I think he's pointing to something more subtle. The, the words indicate something more, the word is actually cunning. 
uh, that's in there. He's referring to what we already do today. It's no different than his day. It's modern church talk. It's therapeutic language that has replaced the moral in our culture. And sadly, it is coming from the pulpits of churches. It is a diluted message that caters to our notion of self-sufficiency rather than a very potent message that conveys Christ's unique sufficiency. The Bible, in turn, becomes a step-by-step manual for happy living. Sermons uh, descend to just simply coffee cup quotes or high-sounding moralism. And it's amazing how much moralistic preaching there is in evangelical churches where folks are coming in and they're essentially being told, now just try and be a better person this week and let me give you seven ways to do that. And then they're sent out and it is absolutely hopeless because they've tried all seven ways and then another five ways and another four ways and it doesn't work because moralism does not work. So are we going to challenge the cultural darkness of our day? Or are we going to try to come up with a gospel that reflects the darkness? Are we going to talk to people about wholeness rather than holiness? Are we going to deal with what the Bible has to say about sin? Or are we going to constantly try to couch it in words like dysfunction? Are we going to offer to people recovery so that they can then limp through the rest of their lives as this psychological therapy that's explaining their predicament and trying to help them forward? Or are we going to talk about salvation? That's the massive distortion and deception, and it comes from the pulpits of churches. And even some of us, I think, are guilty of urging people to receive the benefits of the gospel or we warn them about the perils of ignoring the gospel without ever actually announcing the gospel. And the distinction between the message and the demand to believe is absolutely vital. It may actually be the key to the notions of easy believism that seems to be so prevalent today. And in fairness to the people who are believing these things, I get it. It's relatively easy to believe because they have to believe that they have an issue and God is interested in their issues and that's all they're given. And we all seek that out. But if that was all there was to life, then you just need the self-help section of a bookstore. You don't need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you'll hear things saying, if you have issues this morning, whatever the issue is, fill in the blank. I just want you to know that God is the God of all the issues. That's true. I'm not going to deny that that is not true, but that's not going to help them. Not unless we explain what the real issue is. We are alienated from God on account of our sins, and all of our other problems are simply indications of a much bigger problem. And we see this in the world. We see murder and war and divorce and drug addiction, depression, anxiety, perversions of all kinds. And people are wondering, why is this? And we cannot come to them and offer simplistic, moralistic therapy talk. It is no different than giving someone with a tumor an aspirin. We come to them and we say, You know the real issue is that we're separated from God in his holiness and that he is so pure that he cannot even look upon our sin. But I have tremendous news for you that in him sending his son Jesus in his death on the cross, his rising for our justification, he has done everything for us that we could never do for ourselves. And I urge you to be reconciled to God. The difference between preaching and a lecture, preaching is urging That is why Paul doesn't get discouraged. He does not have to think through some new gimmick which will get people out to hear the good news. He knows that the truth is the most exciting and attractive thing in the world. He knows that when you come to people with the truth about themselves, about their lives, about the world in which they live, and when you strip off all the veils of illusion and delusions by which every man and every generation lives and reveals the basic reality of what is there, you get instant attention from that. See, the test of any religion is not whether people like it, whether it's comfortable, or whether it makes them feel good. The test is, is it true? 
Does it fit with reality? Does it explain what is going on in such a way that conforms to the basic experience of every single individual? And the great thing about the gospel is that it is the truth of God and it is revealing the underlining realities of life. When you are talking about the Word of God, you are talking about the way things really are. And it makes sense and clicks in someone's conscience. And that's why Paul says it this way. It speaks to the conscience and not merely the mind. Now, do not misunderstand what he's saying. Uh, Truth is addressed to the mind. God never sets aside human reason. He addresses truth to be considered and weighed and evaluated by the mind. But behind that is the conscience. And a man's conscience can sometimes reach him when his mind is rejecting truth. And it's strange, isn't it, how that works out? But we have a a great example in history. C.S. Lewis, the great English defender of the faith, said that when he became a Christian, he did so as an intellectual agnostic. And he said when he came to Christ, he came though he was dragged, kicked, and screaming, darting his eyes around in every direction, trying to escape the inevitable truth. And his mind was fighting it all the way, but his conscience had already succumbed to the word of God. And he said that the night that he came to Christ, he was the most reluctant convert in all of England. But he came, and he became one of the greatest defenders of the Christian faith. And that was because his conscience was reached. Paul says, that's what I count on. I don't have to depend on my personality. I don't have to depend on my ability to persuade people. I go with a simple statement of truth and the conviction that God is able to reach the conscience even if the mind and the emotions are trying to reject outwardly what I have to say. And therefore, I do not lose heart. You say... If that's the case, then why don't more people believe the gospel? Well, that's the question they evidently asked Paul, which he's facing here at this point. He says, but if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. He's not he's saying, I don't veil it by deception. I don't veil it by deceit. I don't veil it by my personality. I don't veil it by my schemes. So nothing I bring forth is causing the veil. If there is a veil, it is because they are blind. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Here's what Paul is saying. People are perishing because they do not believe. And they do not believe because they are blinded by the devil. We have to get that order correct because then you will think it's a human battle and not a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle first before it's ever something in the flesh. He says the God of this age, the God behind the scenes of world events, the God who the world unconsciously worships, pays allegiance to, uh, uh, to everything they think and see, has brainwashed them. Therefore, they cannot understand what the good news is. They do not believe it because there's a veil blinding them from the truth. And here's how Satan works that. Satan is happy for men to be anything just as long as they're not Christians. He has no problem with religion. He has no problem with spirituality. He has no problem with moralism served up with a thin veneer of Christian theology. He will be happy to encourage people to deal with their issue in a therapeutic world, provided they do not ever themselves believe that they live in a world that is morally accountable to the one who created it, and one who is just and over and holy and righteous. He'll let everything go. He will oppose nothing but the proclaiming of the gospel. And so this is a very revealing passage. Paul says the devil's tool is the veil. That veil is the delusion that we are adequate to handle life by ourselves. It is the independent sense of pride that says, I don't need any help. I can handle it myself. I don't need a religious crutch. I don't need a savior. And that is the veil that lies over the minds of people to keep them from seeing the death and condemnation that awaits at the end of this fading glory we call life. And the devil's purpose, Paul says, is to keep men and women from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of God who is in Christ and the likeness of God. That's the whole purpose. 
And so one of the great proofs that the Bible knows what it's talking about in life is that it confirms that everywhere, all over the earth, in every generation, and in every culture, every background, men long to be like God. They want to be in charge. They want to run things. They want to make the final decisions about what happens to them. They want to control others and the events of their lives. And they are frustrated and challenged if they cannot do this. If you don't believe me, turn on the news. They long to be like God. Now, here's where it's so clever and so cunning. There's nothing wrong with that. You're like, well, what, where are you going, preacher? Hear me out. Give me a couple of seconds to show you what's going on. This is what God made us for. The very dignity of humanity is that it was intent of God from the very beginning from here on this earth that we would manifest his qualities and his characters. We are made in the image of God. He has implanted that in the hearts of men and women everywhere in the world. It is not wrong to desire to be like God. We were made in his image. But what is wrong is our prideful arrogance that assumes we can do this on our own by our own efforts, our own power, and our own abilities that we can run the universe and we don't need God. That's the lie. That's the veil that the devil uses to brainwash human beings everywhere to keep them from seeing that the only way they will ever be God-like is through Jesus. He is the secret to godliness. Here's why I'm using those words. The word godliness is just a shortened form of God-likeness. That's all the word comes from. We are made to be like God. We were never commanded to be God. And the minute we step out in our pride, that's why the, the lie works so well with Eve. He doesn't want you to be like him. Ultimately, he doesn't want you to be him and equal to him. Because the desire to be godlike is on us. But now pride is we just want to be God himself. No longer reflecting his character, his nature. A godly person is a godlike person. One who is reflecting the character of God. And the great secret of the devil seeks to hide is that Jesus is that very secret. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We are commanded to be like God, godliness. We are never commanded to be God. So what hope is there then for anybody who has been blinded by the devil? How are they ever going to believe the good news? It looks hopeless, doesn't it? If a veil lies over their minds, and as we've already seen in the previous passage, only when someone turns to the Lord is the veil actually removed, yet in order to turn, the veil needs to be removed. You begin to see, I'm just chasing my tail at this point. What hope is there? Well, it's very evident from this that men cannot remove the veil themselves. Only Christ takes it away. So then how can man be saved? And Paul says, ah, that's where preaching comes in. That's why I've been sent, verse 5. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So here's what you do. You proclaim Jesus as Lord. And it's a fantastic statement that he is making. And so we need to examine what he's saying. First, the apostle is saying, don't look to us for any help. I got nothing to offer you. Uh, I, I'm not coming preaching myself. I can't fix you. This is not my ministry. I hate that term. Oh, it, it's my ministry. You don't have a ministry. It's God's ministry, and you're simply a steward and a su uh, servant of God's ministry. You just get to participate. Praise God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the key to what Paul's saying. In the first century, this was the fundamental declaration of the good news. Jesus is Lord. Not he is going to be Lord someday, sometime in the future when he returns. He is Lord. When he rose from the dead, he said to his own disciples, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He is in control. He is in charge right now. He is running human history. All the events that occur in the world today occur because he permits them or has brought them into being. He is Lord. He is in charge. And he is the need of hu every human heart everywhere to see he is Lord. Romans 10 is very clear 
the issue of salvation. Paul says, this is the message of faith that we proclaim. So I should stop and go, what's the message, Paul? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you catch what he's saying? It's not Jesus as Savior. I, I know a lot of people are being told, if you receive Jesus as your Savior, you'll be saved. The Bible never says that. I, I hate to break it to you, but he doesn't say that. He must be Lord. He is Lord whether you know it or not. It's really, am I submitting to who really is the Lord? The reason the message of lordship is so important is because the veil used by Satan is a veil that blinds us to the lordship of Jesus and causes us to proclaim that we are lord of our own life. That's why it's such a, a contrast and such a battle, and Paul is bringing it so strong. We're trying to be lord and not God-like, revealing the true character of the true lord. And so that's why that message has to go out. But when you bow to that lordship, when you know that he is Lord and you consent to him and exercising his lordship in your life, then he saves you. See, Lord is who he is, saving is what he does. And when you realize you are not your own, you were bought at a price and you agree to that, then not only is he your Lord, but he begins to deliver you, to save you from yourself and the world around you. And so on the basis of lordship, Paul argues, that the moment a person sees Jesus as Lord, God's creative power begins to operate in his life and light comes out of his darkness and the veil is removed. Now notice how he puts it. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. He takes us back to creation. When the whole world lay in darkness, nobody could do anything about it except God. And he said, let there be light. And suddenly out of the darkness, light sprang up in obedience to the creative word of the living God. Paul's argument is that the preaching of Jesus as Lord, the center and heart of all reality, the one in control of all events, is a message that is honored by God. And God is a being of incredible power and authority to do this creative work. In fact, he is the one who at creation commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. Notice how it's worded. He did not command the light to shine into the darkness. He literally commanded the darkness to produce light. That's what Paul says happens here before any man and woman ever becomes a Christian. God has to say again that creative word, let light shine out of darkness. And when he does, the darkness disappears. The light shines out of the heart. And as Paul says, what happened to me on the Damascus road? He's referencing back to his history. The light shone into the darkness of my deluded heart. And I saw that Jesus is Lord. And he goes to, on to say that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God therefore is seen in the face of Christ. So through proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, God will do a creative act and call light out of their darkness. And so for this reason, the Christian can always witness in hope, knowing that a sovereign God will work in resurrection power to call light out of darkness from many, many hearts. This is what God is saying to us in these words. And where do you find the light of the glory of God? In the face of Jesus Christ. Where do you see the face of Jesus Christ? In Scripture. I mean, this book is about Jesus, not you. And, and this book is about what he has done. The Gospels give you a record of his amazing life on earth. The epistles explain the implications of his life and his death and his resurrection his working for us. The Old Testament is full of anticipations of his character and being and function. And as you read them, and you let the Spirit of God interpret them, the face of Christ becomes clearer and clearer. That is how light comes out of the darkened heart. So are you walking in darkness? Begin to seek the face of Christ. That's where the light shines. Not the Christ you hear in popular preaching around me. There's nothing historic 
about what he has accomplished and done for you. He's not your little guru to help you on in life. He is Lord, King, and Savior. But in the scriptures, you have this authentic Jesus. And in the fellowship of people of God, the character and the love of Jesus come through. In moments of communion and prayer, you see the face of Christ. That is what turns off the darkness, brings light into your life. And you do not have to walk in darkness in this day and age when you can look at the face of Christ, for it is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God for all to see. And so Paul goes, don't lose heart. No matter how much pushback that you get, no matter how many unspoken expectations are laid on you, assumptions that are made uh, about what you really believe and think, he goes, do not lose heart because this is a ministry of the gospel that has been given to you solely by the mercy of God. You do not have to rely on yourself. You do not have to use deception. You do not have to use distortion to bring light into someone's life. You simply have to proclaim Jesus as Lord and let the creative work of God bring forth light. This is an amazing passage, and it's a great reminder of what Christ has done for us. And so we transition this time of confession and communion. And so during our time of confession, if you're our guest, what we mean by confession is not open mic and you've got to tell us your darkest secrets. It's going to be a, a time of just some gentle music will be over the top. You're confessing to God, where have I struggled? Where have I shrunk back from this gospel message? Where have I not been bold? Where have I not taken the opportunities? Where have I thought of it as my ministry and in my strength and in my personality to do this and that we turn that over to him going, God, this is a ministry given by simply the mercy of God. Let me be a good steward of the gifts that you've already given me. And that we would be bold in our proclamation that Jesus is Lord. And so ask for that strength and that boldness and that courage to do that very thing. The band will come up and after a time of that confession, we'll open up the communion tables. There's two in the middle and two on the wings. And we practice open communion here. You do not have to be a member of the church to partake, but we do ask that you are a follower of Jesus Christ because when you take it, you are saying, this has been done on my behalf. The veil has been lifted because Jesus tore the ultimate veil. Light has shone out of darkness in my own heart, and I do this in remembrance of him to continue to see the face of Christ and the revealed glory of God through him. And so at the table as you come, we have the bread that represents the broken body of Jesus. The fullness of God's wrath was poured out that while I was alienated from God, that he would take that wrath to bridge and bring us back to God and to one another. And then through the wine, that as we dip that wafer into it, it is a reminder of the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sin, that I have been washed clean, that that veil has been lifted. I can see clearly what God has called me to do. We have a small cup that has gluten-free for those that may have allergies, sealed communion elements for those that may be having health issues and, and need those individually sealed communion. So feel free to use those. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again just for your word, that we would always be people of your word because it's the only place that light shines. That is, it reveals the nature of who you are, what you have accomplished in Jesus Christ on our behalf, that it frees us to see the world and all that it is, that we see the reality of our own brokenness, we see the magnificence and beauty of who you are, and that we were created in your image to reflect your character, not take your place. And so let us all recognize that we have a ministry of this gospel proclamation given to us by your mercy. It is because we are saved, that we are redeemed, that we have been made whole, that we can bring this message to others. We do not need to rely on schemes and gimmicks, deceptions, that we can just bring simply the truth and a boldness, as Paul talks about, because we know it's your truth, your word, and ultimately it's your creative power that brings light into the darkness of the human heart. So let us simply be faithful in proclaiming Jesus as Lord. And that as hearts are drawn to that truth, as the conscience submits to the word of God, that we would be people of light and of the word of truth and of love in all those that we encounter. So let us repent of where we have shrunk back from that. Let us be emboldened by your Holy Spirit. 
And then as we take communion, let us remember the finished work that gives us this ministry of Jesus Christ on our behalf. So Lord, we need your Holy Spirit, your work in our lives for this to be accomplished. We ask this all in Christ's name. Yeah. 
that you would move us to brokenness for all people, that you would increase our generosity. We cannot wait for the day that you come and return and you remove all the poverty and the sickness and the suffering from your world. But until that day, we pray as Jesus prayed, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Lead us to be instruments of your mercy to the hurting, to the poor, to the sick, to the orphaned, to the enslaved, to sin. Lord, we want them to be free. Make us willing to give of possessions, to be the givers of your gospel. Lord, increase our love. You said we can give all that we possess to the poor. We can even surrender our bodies to the flames. But if we don't have love, then nothing is gained. So we fervently pray, increase our love for people in this room, in the children's area, outside of these walls, because we are all the least of these. And we pray it. In your strong name, amen. Give us the love for peace. Move us to brokenness. Yes, our generosity, release from slavery and poverty.
so let the sick run free oh the orphan find her home the captured man will for you this morning. I don't know what's going on or apparently not enough. We got to get some stuff happening, but watch CCB. I'm sure we'll get back on track next week. Go live life.